Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Data Scientist Show. Today we have Christopher Fricker. Chris is a senior director in analytics and BI at Renaissance Learning, a PE-backed company. He started his career in finance and later became a data science consultant where his main client includes uh, Meta, Netflix, and pre-IPO tech companies doing analytics. Today we'll talk about his journey from finance to data science and to an analytics leader managing a team of data scientists, engineers. If you like the show, subscribe to the channel, leave a comment, give me a five-star review. Welcome to the show, Chris. Thank you so much, Diana, for that intro. And I already liked and subscribed. So yeah, definitely do that if you're listening. Let's get into it. So how did you get into data science from finance? I started my career in finance and accounting. And I realized very quickly that whole career path, that whole domain, you can do that much better if you are good with data and if you amplify your work with data. So it was really day one of my first finance job was when I like really started to peel back the layers of the onion on data and what what actually happens inside a company that produces data, why the data exists and what kinds of questions I can help answer with data. Over the years, it's just been like a a lifelong kind of career-long journey of curiosity and just self-learning on everything data. Mm -hmm. And you also became a director at a very young age. So what's the secret thought of getting promoted so fast? Well, one, I'm not that young. I know I look young, but uh, that's because I stay hydrated and moisturized. But yeah, I am a little, maybe a little younger than my peers. So I think first and foremost, it really comes down to two things. One is emotional intelligence. As As any sort of leader, your job is to really help manage the emotional state of yourself and the people around you. So I always think of leadership in terms of the Titanic, <laughs> horrible example, but imagine you're on the Titanic and it's sinking and everyone's panicking, right? A leader is really someone who in that moment can stay calm and control themselves and then control what they can around them and the emotional state and make sure they're they're giving off that energy. And One, that's something I just developed in myself over years, just a a sense of calm and and collectiveness. And then two, I think, two, it's just hard work. (laughs) If you're in your 20s and you're listening to this, you're here. I'm hearing this advice kind of float around, but you, if you want to be successful, the price is your 20s. Um, you, you have to work like nobody else is working. There were times when, when I was a consultant, I was basically working full time for both Netflix and Facebook at the same time. And that was incredibly challenging. But in one year, I doubled my work experience in many ways. I don't say that I don't put that on my I have more work experience than I do. But yeah, you have a capacity in your 20s that really starts to degrade as you age. That's just science. I'm not making any sort of a there are a lot of benefits to wisdom and getting older. But Everything in life compounds, so invest heavily when you can and you have the energy and learning. Mm-hmm. Yeah, let's talk about your experiences in uh, working with Meta and Netflix. So what are some lessons you learn from there? Or maybe give us a very high-level introduction of what kind of work did you do? Yeah, it was a mix. I think it was a mix of product analytics. It was a mix of just business intelligence and, and automation. One of my One of my takeaways was, so I started my career at Johnson & Johnson for many years, and that is a 130-year-old company, 130-plus-year-old company, which, by the way, is incredibly impressive. The average tenure in the S&P 500 is about 24 years. So people like to think that these big Mm. companies stay around forever, right? But there are actually very few businesses that survive more than 10, 20, 30 years. So it's sort of magical when a company does. So I came from that world of, hey, here's here are the important soft skills and how to run a large enterprise and how to develop talent. 
And then I kind of was really exposed to Meta and Netflix and like that Bay Area ethos, which is completely different. <laughs> like move fast, break things is, which is no longer Meta's slogan. I don't or mm -hmm. they took that off the wall or something. But, but you go to those companies and it's almost stepping 100 years into the future, right? So being able to see both those kind of worlds was really eye-opening. And in many ways, those companies are the future. You'd be shocked at just some of the simple tools that their engineers will develop for their mm -hmm. own purposes. Yeah. Could probably be billion dollar companies and they don't even know it. And I, I think I don't think people in, in the Bay Area or, or in tech in general appreciate all the time how difficult it is to optimize or run a company for a long period of time and, and have a company survive over many decades. Yeah. And you mentioned some engineers there can create some internal tool later can become a whole company. I think there are some cases already. So there are a lot of new tools coming every day and they're like old tools that are going away. So what are your hot take on the modern tech stack versus what do you think is going to be obsolete? It's a really good question. It's almost impossible to answer. If you look at what's happening with software engineering costs, take anybody's opinion on AI and, and uh, whether or not it's a real phenomenon. But what I can tell you for certain is it will be cheaper to develop software in the future. So what that means is new tools will come out, right? New tools, new tech stacks, new ways of solving problems will will come out. And I think of it more in terms of issues. So what problems are these tools solving for a company? Do I have a tool that lets me extract data very easily? Five years ago, the, the answer to that was actually really confusing. But now we have things like Fivetran, right, where you can just plug it in, extract data from any data source. Do I have a tool that lets me manage and audit my logic and my metrics that I've developed? That was another question that was difficult to answer a few years ago. But now we have DBT and we can use GitHub in the data analytics stack. What will emerge over the next two, three years? It's anyone's guess. I have a feeling we've almost solved all the little problems in terms of collect or taking data out of storage, piping it into something, whether it's a dashboard or a model, and then reporting it. Like that has been solved by five to 10 different tools, I feel like some player is going to come in and really verticalize and just start to own the whole stack. And I actually think it's already happening because if you look at what Microsoft is doing, some of their tooling with Fabric is frankly unbelievable. And I don't know how they're moving so quickly. First of all, the Elon Musk autobiographies or biography is great, but I want to hear about how Satya Nadella is completely transforming Microsoft. It's shocking what he's doing and the speed at mm -hmm. which they're innovating. So in terms of the future tech stack, I think all I can say is it's it's going to change quickly. So make sure if you work in this field, you're nimble with your learning and your education and you're not too married to one, one dance partner. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so now as a senior director, do you still play with those tools? Do you write code? Um, does your managers write code? Yeah, that's a great question. I think one of my favorite trainings I went through at Johnson & Johnson talked about the difference between power and authority. Mm. And I think a lot of people really rely heavily on authority, which comes from your title and it comes from rank, but there are other also don't build your power as a leader, I think you will find yourself in very difficult positions. And power really comes from technical competence, most often. So I always encourage my managers and myself to make sure you're devoting some time to development, some time to actually building things and writing code. Now, the contours of that will really start to change as well with AI. So that would have been a great soundbite two, three years ago, but it's super obvious that SQL, like the barriers to entry for SQL will just continue mm -hmm. to dec decline. Yeah. And in that world, then I think competence and technical competence actually comes from domain knowledge and domain expertise. So I don't, it's hard to imagine in five years hiring 10 SQL masters 
but it, it's easy to kind of envision a world where I have to hire 10 people who really know accounting well or 10 people who really understand psychometrics. And I think if, if you, whatever your career journey is, just make sure you're building competence, technical competence and technical depth in something beyond just managing people. And that's another kind of Steve Jobs lesson. He famously says, we, we don't, we try not to hire professional people managers because they can't really get anything done. Not saying that there's not a place for that or that everyone has to become like a product designer or some expert in something. I'm speaking strictly to folks who like really want to advance in their career and drive forward some sort of field. Yeah. So I agree with the uh, barrier to enter the SQL. Technical skill is getting lower and lower. I think so does basically every other programming tools. And eventually people saying the programming language probably just going to be English. Writing code is not difficult. It's difficult to know what problem to solve, what question to ask, and what tools you want to use to solve those problems. When you are facing a new problem, a new data set, especially, you're probably dealing with a lot of ambiguity. How do you decide what questions to ask? Oh, so I'm a huge believer in first principles thinking. I think, I, and I actually don't think a lot of folks uh, have, have drilled into the first principles of what that means. It literally means question everything from the very beginning. Right. If I if I'm trying to come up with a with a good question, which I do think is step zero in a lot of endeavors, you really have to question everything. And I, the reason I started in finance and, and whatever you folks on LinkedIn want to call it was in 2008. I was a bit young. I was still in in school, and the economy completely collapsed, and people were losing jobs, and nobody could explain why. So the mm -hmm. the answer from economists was. We didn't see it coming and we have no idea what happened and we can't tell you when it'll happen again. So I started studying economics and quickly after that, you realize, oh, I have to study finance to really understand economics. And then after that, you realize you have to study accounting to really understand finance. And then to understand accounting, you kind of have to understand all of the systems within which accounting data lives. And to understand that, you have to understand data and you have to understand systems and compute and how computers work. And you kind of go down like all these rabbit holes of asking questions. But that is truly what it means to be a first principles thinker, you have to start with like the very first why. And I started with many whys before the economics question too. It's like, why do I buy something? I think that's a really interesting question. Nobody quite has answered too well in all of economics, they have a word called utility, which is like a funny nobody quite really knows what that word means. Uh, I'm just like overly skeptical and overly uh, questioning of many things in every situation. I think that often leads me to answer like an actual productive question. Not saying I sit there and ponder for hours. So the other thing about running a business is you have to make decisions super quick, yeah. super quick, and you have to make the best one possible. So I'm, please don't think I'm saying like everyone should be a philosopher. I'm simply saying build up that foundational knowledge of the world so that you can really handle those day to day, the little questions, because once you answer like some of the bigger questions, it's a little easier to figure out what comes next. Yeah. And you talk about speed, especially in analytics, sometimes you don't have a lot of time to be 100% confident in your answer. So how do you evaluate the trade off between speed and the quality of the answer? Yeah, that's a great question. And I always start with the cost of time is incredibly high. So it goes back to the First, you just have to build that into your operating system. Like one day of delay is way more costly than I think folks realize. And you, and you get an appreciation for that when you do study finance, because the one day of delay compounds over many years. And that's mm -hmm. why moving faster is typically a more valuable approach than waiting for perfect information. And that's another Jeff Bezos quote, by the way, I like me, I think he says something like I like making decisions with 70% of the information I wish I had, which I think is a good kind of like, rule of thumb, like gut feel that you can develop. Yeah. But you'll know you, 
you gotta, you have to develop that sense. Like, okay, is this taking too long? I think of things in terms of like blitzes. I one of my biggest pet peeves are these two week sprints. I don't know what like what machine they have in 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 tech school or like IT school or business schools that that pipes in everyone's mind that everything has to happen on a two week mm-hmm. timeline. Most things can be done way faster, and I, I just. If you just set an expectation of two days, then really magical things can happen. Yeah, I think it might be from some engineering uh, culture. I remember when I worked at Amazon, we would do the sprint planning with the engineering team. And uh, everybody estimate like a little score, give it some estimation of how many hours it might take. But like you said... Data science analytics projects sometimes can happen really fast. It could be a query, uh, but sometimes you might need uh, more than two weeks. Sometimes it's really hard to estimate how long it might take. What I think is maybe it's more directional. So sometimes, especially for the uh, scientist persona, I feel like people, especially for me, I have challenges to commit. Oh, I want to give you like a update in two weeks. But if I have a deadline, at least... It helps me to think, oh, what are some kind of minimal kind of MVP of my analysis I can give my manager to give them an update, even if I'm not fully ready. And that's helpful for the business. I think it's more of a nudge than a hard deadline for the science analytics teams. What do you think? I completely agree. I'm not saying to move so fast that you're like, duct taping and cobbling everything together. I think it's more of a mindset. It's an aspiration. And one thing that was really shocking to learn in in the world of corporate finance, and this is like an insight from multiple CFOs have, have said this to me, multiple people, because how can you go to a VP and just say, hey, your budget's cut by 5% this year? Mm-hmm. Uh, make it happen. That's literally what CFOs do very frequently. And every single time, the person will say, I can't do it. That's impossible. Like, I literally can't do it. Do you know how many things will break? Magically, almost every time, and this happened, this has happened at companies that have been around for 100 years, magically, the person hits their budget. They make it happen. So there is some sort of like magic sauce in an expectation that makes people behave in a very different way. So if you set an expectation of two weeks, you're going to get things in four weeks. But if you set an expectation of two days, you'll it might not be two days, but you'll get it certainly faster than if you started with a two day deadline. Yeah, it seems like you learned a lot of important lessons from finance that you have adopt in your work philosophy and for our data scientists, what are some important concepts or ideas from finance that you think data scientists should know? I think that's a phenomenal question. I think most data scientists, if one, if you're a data scientist, you're probably a naturally curious person. I don't think you go into that field without some level of curiosity. So I just wanted to start with don't be scared. And know that accounting and finance were the actually the original data science and business, right? So in, in the I think it was the 1500s, Luca Pacioli invented double entry bookkeeping accounting. And since then, it's had a good streak. It's undefeated. It is the original programming language of a company. So if you understand how the three financial statements work, which you can learn, in a couple of weeks, give watch a couple of YouTube videos. You don't have to go get a degree in this anymore. We do not live in that world anymore. Learn how the PL works, the balance sheet works, and the cash flow statements work. I think that's worth a little bit of free time. Once you do that, then you can really start to understand the psychology of business leaders because one of the superpowers of understanding accounting and finance is understanding the motivations of a business and a company. And once you do that, really the world's your oyster. You can start any company you want. You can really impress any executive at a company because you understand what profit is. You understand the equation of net income. So you'll be much more informed in meetings and you'll be much more equipped to give your stakeholders the information they need to make good business decisions. Otherwise, you do a lot of data art 
So this is the other thing I get all the time from data scientists and, and consultants. Like I get a lot of what I call business artwork, yeah. um, which looks really pretty. And it's a lot of, and oftentimes it does have a purpose, but there is a difference between that and an actual insight that someone takes and turns into a billion dollar business decision. And what is the example of uh, data art? I can still resonate with that in my mind because I've definitely seen data science or engineers create a, like a very fancy dashboard or model output, a lot of results, tables, and present it to the manager, but they can't answer, okay, what do we do about it? Exactly. Yeah. So what are some type of data art you observed? And so if someone is making data art, how do we, how do they get out of it? Well, one, I, I almost feel like everything starts as data art and then you mold it. It's like a, it's like a piece of clay. You have to mold it and cut it down to the valuable parts. Um, or maybe a block of marble is a better example, right? You, you kind of sculpt the marble into the valuable piece. I think one fundamental is understanding how finances work at a company. Then you'll know in your mind right then, like, oh, wait a second. Mm, it'd be much more valuable minute for minute, pound for pound for me to focus on this domain than that domain and answer this question instead of the, that question. Two is humans, he, all human beings crave and love simplicity. This is why Apple is a trillion dollar company and some of their competitors are not right like simplicity is true art and it's the hardest thing to do frankly and as data scientists i think it's very easy to overcomplicate and overwhelm other folks when you're spending hours in data hours in a model the first thing you want to do is explain to somebody all the ins and outs as to why your conclusion is super concrete and I've seen a lot of folks just overwhelm or overcomplicate situations, which should be incredibly simple. And I stole this from a book somewhere. And I think it's from, I think the military does it. I really don't, don't know, but there's an acronym called BLUF, B-L-U-F, bottom line up front. So I always try to start all my, I, I literally write it in my email sometimes, but BLUF, B -L -U -F, put my conclusion, and then we'll unpack it and answer questions as people have, have questions. Yeah, kind of like the pyramid method. Yeah, you could call it that pyramid. Or the one thing I like about it is it really washes away all the other structure. It's just okay. What's the bottom mm -hmm. line? What's the number one? If this is a headline on the New York Times, what would that headline say? And what's the most important takeaway? Yeah, and it's something you have to build in every day in every interaction with your stakeholders. Mm -hmm. and it's unnatural. Yeah. It is unnatural. And it's really hard to do, and I think it takes practice. Yeah. I remember one time I showed the analysis I did with to a friend. I was just analyzing some public data. I want to build some side project. And I thought it was very cool. I showed a visualization, a seasonality chart, and then he asked me, so what? And I couldn't answer that. And he asked many more, so what? So what? So what? What do you want people to take away from it? And I think sometimes you just need to ask yourself, you can present your result to a coworker or you can just do a role play with yourself. Just think about if you present to a manager, what question would they ask? They probably wouldn't ask you like a very specific technical questions, but they want to see how does this part fitting the bigger puzzle piece. I think that's a lot of times the way forgot when we're making data art, which is a little counterintuitive because we got into data because we're curious. Right. We want to make data exactly. art. And then we got into a, a company and realized, oh, all the data is messy. All the question is undefined and we can't make data art and exactly. people feel frustrated. No, it really resonates. And really those concepts are really interlinked in the whole like theme here. Yeah. Just think of the CEO of a company. Like the reason bottom line up front is valuable is because as you go up the company hierarchy, you'll find people are more and more overwhelmed with decision making and they always have to make a decision very quickly. Now connect that with the finance and accounting concepts. Okay, here's a CEO and they have to make 40 decisions per day. Well, what are those decisions trying to do? They're trying to improve the financial health of the company, right? And I'm not saying companies aren't mission driven. At J and J, we had a very special mission, right? We had the we had a credo which 
told us how to behave morally and ethically in business situations, which I I can guarantee you every leader from top to bottom in that company follows. But I can also tell you they care deeply about the financial health of that company because they can't execute on that mission to change the world or help or, or drive forward human health if they go bankrupt. And that's why J&J is one of the most, it's, I think it's still one of the few AAA credit rated companies on the planet. They've increased their dividend every year for decades. That's super rare. It's that appreciation of understanding that financial health is super important. Um, you can't do your mission if you're not generating cash flow, if you're not generating profit. So now you understand how the CEO thinks, right? You understand that the CEO is trying to make sure the company is financially healthy, and that's their bottom line. Give them the bottom line from that all the way down to help that mission. I think it's like a it's a pretty big unlock as a data scientist to orient yourself that way. And it is unnatural. You don't get taught that in computer during a computer science degree. Mm-hmm. No one says that. No one sits you down and says that to you. I think uh, that's another like gap in the world of data science. You do get taught that in accounting and finance. Like it's super clear. Yeah. It's super explicit. And we talk about the finance aspect of things and you often ask yourself, how do I sell this? And have you ever questioned about your own value in your company? Not question your own value, but in a way that I think about, oh, why does my company want to help, um, hire me? What they want to get out from this role? And especially think about the analytics team. What is the value of the analytics team? Can you put a price tag on it? I love this question. And I hope everyone lists, I hope everyone's ready for this one. That is a first principles question. You're asking like, okay, well, wait a second. Why do I even need a data team? What is data science? What is data? I, so I run these boot camps and I start them with what is data. And I think because of my background, I've come to think of a company like a computer. If you really try to understand what a business is, in many ways, it's similar to a computer or it's similar to a neural network. It is simply just nodes. It's just a group of people exchanging information. Think about Amazon. How many thousands of employees does Amazon have sending emails back and forth? So the CFO and the COO of Amazon are sitting at their laptops all day exchanging information. They aren't, maybe they do walk around. When I was working, I worked in a manufacturing plant. I would walk around the plant every now and then, (laughs) but I never hit buttons. I was gathering more data and more information because I was a node in that computer. Okay, so now we've put into terms that maybe folks, your listeners can appreciate. If a business is a computer, what makes a computer work better, right? What makes a computer faster? There's a couple things. One is more storage. One is faster RAM. And all that is greasing the skids of information at the company. It's improving the speed at which good information and good data circulates around a company, whether it's if your job is exchanging information, if you're part of the laptop economy, you are a data analyst, you are a data scientist. There is no such thing as a data scientist. There is no such thing as a data analyst. You're all doing the same thing. You're exchanging information between you and your boss or you and another department through email or through a dashboard or a PowerPoint or conversation or a chat, a Slack. And a data specialist team, a data science team is upgrading those pipelines. It's upgrading those, the quality of that information that's being circulated around your business. And you either believe that's a good investment or you believe your folks don't need that and they're great at that on their own. I've met very few leaders in the, in that camp. Almost everyone I've met really appreciates the value of amplifying and enhancing the speed and exchange of data in their company. I can't quantify, I can't give you an ROI on that. So another pet peeve is, hey, yeah, hey, what's the ROI your team generated this year? I used to do that professionally. I used to calculate ROIs within an operation at one of the largest manufacturing plants in the country. And I, it's, I'm, it's really possible to calculate an ROI in the, in the physical world 
and I would do it all the time. So it's really, it's a very, very clear answer. If you upgrade machine number seven, if you spend 100K to upgrade machine number seven, throughput will increase X percent and waste and scrap will reduce by Y percent. And that put gives us this much contribution, scrap costs us this much. So I can tell you exact, like literally the exact ROI on an investment. I cannot tell you an ROI. Can, this is literally incalculable. I can't calculate an ROI on giving a CEO good information because that CEO might then make, like I said earlier, a billion dollar decision based on that data you provided. Or and you might not be giving information directly to the CEO, but you are, you're part of that chain. And if there's an insight, if there's some sort of part of your company that you're in, I guarantee you, your output is flowing up, up, and it's percolating all the way up to some decision maker who, to my earlier comment, will make a decision which really helps your company financially or send you into uh, jeopardy. Yeah. And I've been on teams when the VP of AI and data science didn't want us to calculate an RI using some method to compare the business with our team versus the business without our team. <laughs> and really we good. have to give them a number using our own methods. Literally, um, it's ridiculous. And I'm sorry if that person's listening, but that is ludicrous. And whoever asked for that doesn't understand a business. They don't understand finance and they don't understand data. And by the way, those are great people to sell projects to. So, hey, nothing wrong. No, not everyone's going to listen to this podcast. Just know that is literally impossible because you'd have to simulate the entire, you have to simulate the whole universe to actually answer that question. Now, mm -hmm. I know that sounds crazy, but I do want to say you can calculate ROIs for certain data projects and you absolutely should. You absolutely should. For instance, there is a cost to st live streaming data into a cloud platform and you really need to think carefully if the juice is worth the squeeze. But in terms of investing in a data science team, I know companies who have literally a thousand data science employees and they haven't told anybody. And there's very, and that's a huge percent of their workforce and they are incredibly profitable. And I'm not saying there's causation there, but I'm just saying there is certainly value in, in improving how data is analyzed and shared in your company. Yeah. So for example, in your work, either your current team or your previous team, how do you measure the impact of your team? That's a great question. And I, I want to say no comment, but I will share. There's what I do measure. And then there's what I wish I could measure. So what mm -hmm. I do measure is page views on our dashboards. That's a simple one. If someone's going to a dashboard every day, all right, we created something valuable. Okay. Like it is clearly valuable if someone's using it every day. And our team kind of likes that metric. So user engagement metrics. Yeah, I love those metrics. But what I wish I could track, which I can't, this is why I said it's impossible, is what did that person do after looking at that dashboard? And what decision or conversation did they change or influence because of that insight that they got from the dashboard? That's my ROI. That's what I can claim as an ROI. Right. If someone looked at a, a dashboard mm -hmm. on pricing, okay, I'm not. This is. I'm not talking about the. And by the way, none of my views reflect Renaissance. Um, we are a very mission driven company. We want to improve education, but I just want to say that. But let's say we. I'm at some other company, and we do a dashboard on price, and that gets looked at once a month. But one day, that person looked at it and influenced the pricing decision that generated a $3 million uplift in price. I never find out. I actually know people don't tell me about that because that person wants to claim credit for it. And they should, they got, they did the hard work of actually thinking of the insight, but that is the ROI of, of, of a, of a data team, right? Like you can't capture that in any sort of spreadsheet or analysis. You just have to have faith. Have you thought about sending a survey? to the users. Hey, thanks for using our dashboard. Can you tell us yeah. some success stories? And did you ever get anything from it? We do that. We pulse people, we try to get 
success stories. I love so my 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 leadership ethos is like you get the fame, I get the blame, right? So I never mm -hmm. want to collect stories that like then I go take credit for. I, sometimes we we have to put it in slides, but I, I think people are scared of that, so they won't really even share most of what they've done with your work, and that's totally fine. Like I don't have we don't have an ego like I want my team to just understand that we're just a valuable piece of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. But we yeah. do do that. And I do have conversations with leaders all the time. And I do collect right. anecdotes like that. And, mm -hmm. But it's not an yeah. official. I don't then pipe that into a dashboard because I can't quantify that. Right. It's anecdotal. But I think the anecdotal impact complements kind of those are qualitative complements with yeah. a quantitative metrics that tells the full story. And I might slightly disagree with that. I don't think it's an ego thing. I think it's important validation that you created something useful. Your dashboard is useful. It makes you believe someone actually used it to make useful information. And then Well, totally agree. And let me reframe it maybe a little slightly. The worst problem I think you can create as a data team is creating like a thousand dashboards. Mm -hmm. that nobody's using yeah. right? or a dashboard that someone opens once. And I use the word dashboard. I know a lot of your listeners don't do dashboards. They might do like a Jupyter notebook and they write some really beautiful long analysis. Models, and they, analysis, and they post it. yes. Or yeah. they're building, mo they're training models. That's a lot. Well, when I, so when I use the word dashboard, you can swap it out as machine learning model too, because PwC did a study and I forget the exact percent, but it was, a huge percent of machine learning projects like did absolutely nothing for a company. Yeah, It was data art. So please don't think that I'm like so against ROIs or that you shouldn't be tracking this. I'm just saying it's really hard to track. And I don't like those conversations. I don't think they're productive. I think it's more productive starting with what, okay, what are we trying to do? What's our goal? What's our purpose? And let me just focus on solving the problems in front of me instead of doing like, financial astrology to try to answer whether mm. or not this is the right business decision. But there are the, where, the, where there's smoke, there's fire. If, no, if your usage is zero, no one's looking at your work, you have a big problem as a data team. You have a big problem. Yeah. And I think it's interesting you mentioned you just need to have trust in the data science team in the process that the analytics will somehow generate revenue, help someone make a decision. However, if you are in a new company or some industry that didn't value data, you, you still have yeah. to show them some example that this is valuable, right? So how do you, you democratize data in a company? You have to show them the example. And the thing with trust in your reputation, I forget which billionaire I stole this quote from, but it is like a bank and you can, I think this was another Steve Jobs. It's a bank and you can make deposits or withdrawals in it. And you got to realize the first few conversations are so valuable. You don't get much of that trust when you just first meet somebody and they can, they will lose faith in you super quick. So that's why as a data scientist, you did all the hard work of understanding, okay, here's how to build a model. Here's how to build a dashboard. Now it's time to do the work of, okay, what does uh, this department do? What's their real goal? So that you can nail those first few conversations and build that trust and really understand their need as a stakeholder, right? Because if you understand their need, then you can build an output that's really pointedly addressing that need. Mm -hmm. And I love this. I had a colleague say this. I, I forget uh, his name, but give them exactly what they want. Don't They'll describe your problem to you and say, oh, I want to, I want a model that scores this for me, or I want a dashboard that says this, give them exactly that. Then add the, add on all the other great stuff you build along the way that really maybe shows a completely different picture. So it's another way to build trust with your stakeholders because um, it's a service business. You're serving that you're, we're providing a service to them. And think about a service. If a Grand Hyatt gave you terrible service once and it was your first time there, you're probably not going to go back. Luckily, Grand Hyatt's a phenomenal hotel chain. So they, they give you good service when you start there and they kind of keep up, they re replicate that experience. So try to do that in your work as a data scientist. Give a five-star yeah. service. I like you mentioned, you have to give them exactly what they want and then you can add your other ideas inside. I think in 
persuasion, there's something called pacing and leading. You have to be on the same page with them <laughs> so they know you're on the same team with them. And then you can say, okay, this is what you want. So they're satisfied. And by the way, this is what I think. Especially when I was a machine learning consultant at the team at AWS. So sometimes the customer would be, they will have some very specific ask. I want to build a model this way. I think it will solve the problem that we know that might not work, but you have to do this to show them it doesn't work. And then you can't just tell them, hey, this is wrong, unless you can prove it to them. Also, you have to have another solution that you already built right. that, hey, this works better. So that's how they can be convinced and trust your solution. Absolutely. That's how you build that trust. That's how you convince them. And I love that you brought up pacing and leading. I think that's another, that's an advanced topic, right? So <laughs> persuasion, once you study business, you should really study things like communication and persuasion, right? That's equally valuable. And a lot of people shy away from that. They're like, oh, it's not, it kind of feels uncomfortable. a little dark. Yeah, manipulative. <laughs> but, but then really think about, oh, like I, I get persuaded too. I, I, there are certain things that I need someone to persuade me on. I have a lot of, we all have a lot of priors that are like cemented in our mind. And sometimes yeah. you do need to be persuaded of certain things. So it's important to study things like pacing and leading and especially in business because really your job is to persuade. <laughs> if you're a data worker, if you're an information worker, you should be, your job is to persuade people. And that, what is a CFO doing? They're not human calculators. Like a CFO, well, some of them are. I, I have had certain VPs who like were shockingly good at arithmetic, like mental math, which is like freaky. Um, but they're not human calculators. They're trying to persuade other leaders. And the best way to not persuade someone is by just starting a conversation with, hey, this is my opinion. Here's exactly why you're wrong. And you're just always yeah. wrong. It's a lot of scientists, data or engineers communicate, by the way. Yeah. And it's like, why? These are such smart people. Yeah. Why don't they realize that the human, the other, their human counterparts are just other components of the system? So if you're trying to understand and be a player in the system, you have to get good at interacting with those other nodes and those other components. So I'm putting mm -hmm. that into a super technical term, but hopefully technical folks can appreciate that, right? If yeah. you're just super introverted, that's fine. But unless you want to live by yourself in a hut in the middle of Montana, you're not going to get a lot of jobs or be an effective data scientist if you don't understand how to persuade and, and play nicely with others. Yeah, yeah. I think it's it's less related to introversion, extroversion. Introverted, you can also be very persuasive. And I think a lot of people have the misconception, they're holding on to the identity, right? Oh, mm -hmm. I'm an introvert. I don't like to talk to people, so I don't like to interact with the business. You don't have to be an extrovert. You just need to learn how to speak their language and uh, how to express your ideas and make it as accessible, translate your ideas, your models into their language. So oh, for data true. scientists, what are your advice on persuade business leaders? Or say if someone wants to persuade you, mm -hmm. what language should, should they speak? Yeah, that's a great question. And there's a lot of what I'll call just like data art. There's a lot of like psych psychology art and pop psych, yeah. right? And a lot of that, it's shocking how much of it gets debunked every four or five years. Mm. And I'm saying these things because if you start researching some of this, you'll find content like, oh, here's here are the five types of decision makers. And this is persona A. Like I've literally sat through trainings like this. And I'm like, what? This really? person, you might as well be reading a synopsis of Harry Potter to me because it's just all made up. But like, they'll be like, hey, here's how decision maker A, the rationalist thinks of a decision. Here's how decision, here's how this persona, the passionate person think, makes a decision. But there's certain concepts that are enduring. And some of them are in Robert Cialdini's book. I think it's just influence. called Persuade Influence. Yeah, Influence. I think that's a timeless book, which is where I think pacing and leading came from. And in that book, uh, he talks about some of the key ingredients of persuasion. One of them is 
authority. So when I started a conversation, or when you started a conversation, you say, I worked at AWS as a data scientist. That instantly gives you a level of credibility and authority that persuades people that you know what you're talking about. You and I know that's that holds very little bearing on anyone's expertise or command in an area. Okay, I met Harvard MBAs who are just like confused about simple <laughs> business concepts. I, yeah. I don't know how that's possible. Yeah, Nothing against Harvard. I've also met Harvard MBAs who are like the freakiest, smartest people people I've ever seen in my life. But yeah. uh, the one the, one of the superpowers of learning that like persuasion is understanding, okay, people are really easily convinced by authority. And that's really not a great measure of credibility. Mm-hmm. Another what are, what's one of the other ingredients of it's like authority. I see I have to read the book. But that's one Likeness. that stuck out. I don't know. Also was it scarcity? Yes, that's yeah, scar- scarcity. People will liking people like the people who are like them. Okay. So that's another great one. If you one. buy something, so. <laughs> I remember in some towns yes. I traveled to, they will pretend to speak your language, they fake your accent because you feel Similarity. oh, they are like me. Yeah. For example, if you're a data scientist, if you want to get engineers to work with, you need to understand what system or language they're building. You need to speak their language instead of showing something in the Jupyter Notebook. Maybe you package that in a way that's easy for them to adopt, right? And also with business leaders, maybe you should speak less about p-values or or statistical tests to speak their language. Going back to the authority, yeah, I think a lot of times... Data scientists, engineers, we want to be humble. So for example, when I first, for example, doing some public speaking or writing contents online, I constant reference, oh, I used to work at Amazon. I sometimes feel, oh, that's so obnoxious. Like why Mm. I have to keep mentioning that. But then I realized it's not about me. I know that will give me credibility. So if I truly yeah. believe the story I'm telling, the idea I want people to learn from, then that make it easier for people to learn. So I'm, in another way, I think I'm helping people to learn from me. Yeah. So with that thinking, I think it reduces the fear of, oh, is it about my ego or some things, and then it's easier to influence people in a positive way. That's a great point. It uh, it makes it just easier to influence. And you learn these things, one, as a defense mechanism so that you are not as easily persuaded. But two, it is those are ingredients that if you sprinkle them in, really help you in in life. And I think even the the similarity one, uh, it, it gets even more basic than that, Daliana. Like, I start almost every meeting trying to find something in common with somebody. Just one, because mm-hmm. I like doing it. I'm, I like being personable and I like learning about people. But I'll, I'll join a call and I'll realize, I'll be like, oh, where are you, where are you at? And they'll be like, oh, I'm in Georgia. I'm like, oh, wow, I lived in Georgia for a year. Have you been to Creature Comforts Brewery? It's a great brewery. You find little things like that. Figure out what you have in common with somebody and it makes every conversation easier. It's a good, it's a good life hack. Um, if you're just going into meetings silent, this is all the time. This is all, this is like constantly. I'm like, think about it. You're in that, the business is a computer and you're one stick of RAM and there's the other stick of RAM. Mm-hmm. And if they're not talking or connecting, you don't have a good computer or you're not a good stick of RAM. I'm um, putting it in a very technical term. We could use a hundred different analogies, but find a way to make a connection and just kind of, like I said, grease the skids of relationships and information at your company. Yeah. Since we are nerding out on the seven principles of influence, I just Googled it. I'm going to rate it. (laughs) Those are reciprocity, commitment, or consistency, uh, consensus or social proof, uh, authority, liking, scarcity, and unity. Some of them, I don't remember what it exactly means, but I think I remember reciprocity. For example, if you are at Whole Foods, they give you some free sample. You just feel you kind of have to buy it after you try it, right? So basically, sometimes I know it's free, but I don't want to deal with the pressure, the guilt, so I don't try. It's never free. And the same in the business, right? If someone 
you can offer more help, be more generous, even without expectation. So I think that people give you free sample. They don't expect everyone try it to buy, but maybe one in 10 or some people would buy. It's so good. Uh, all right. So be yes. more generous at work, help people. I have a very radical point of view on that. I had a leader once get quoted in an article that got published in some Silicon Valley, I don't know, whatever. Mm. And the leader said, well, the relationships are not about transactions. And I really thought about that for a while. And let me just say, what makes life fulfilling are relationships, right? At the end, you look back, the only thing that made it worth it and fun were the relationships and the people you met. So I really take my relationships very seriously. So when you kind of connect that with the reciprocity idea, something that like I've done with someone I'm really interested in, or they think they would, I would have a really good conversation with, I might send them an article that I thought they might be interested in, just email them yeah. an article or something. I don't know. And that's a bid. That's a, hey, like I thought of you. I actually think you'd find this article interesting. Can I give you something? I want to build a relationship and I want to hear from you that turn into something over time. And I have relationships of everything in my career. It's probably the one thing I take the most seriously and I care the most deeply about. I have people I've met 12 years ago who I might just ping once every two years. But I know their wife's name. I know their passion. I know what they do for fun. I can ask them something. Like I forget a lot about the difference sometimes between a an encoder and a decoder or whatever. But what I make sure I don't forget are for those really valuable relationships. I don't forget to reach out to them, give little bids, give little asks. Yeah, this sometimes could be as simple as I thought of you like, hey, how's it going? I have another friend. He told me he found it difficult to catch up with a lot of friends um, over the phone or grab all the coffees. He just sent his friends some, sometimes some voice memos so you can chat kind of async way, connect. I think there are a lot of ways that, that you yeah. can, you know, keep in touch. Well, I've actually done that in business too. Just put the persuasion in relationship. The voice memos, by the way, is a great way to communicate mm -hmm. insights and actual information. So I've done voice memos and sent them to bosses. Really adds a lot of context to a message uh, that you can't like add in a text or a video. But yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. So now you manage a team and a lot of times data scientists and analysts, when they just join a new team, they want to prove themselves through making data art. And how do you coach them to think bigger? Think about the things we talk about, all oh, the influence, building a relationship with stakeholders or coworkers, especially they're anxious about their performance. Maybe their horizon is in the next three months. Oh my God, am I going to get pipped? Am I going to get a raise? How do they get out of that mindset? Yeah. I think you have to read the room and some days you will be the person cranking through and you have to just be the best hammer for that nail mm -hmm. you possibly can be. Sometimes that's like the least important thing. So there will be situations where you need to rapidly learn some new technology. Like You have to stay up all night because tomorrow yeah. you need to finish an analysis. Mm -hmm. Then there will be situations where, wait, the analysis took an hour. And now I have to spend a week crafting a narrative and crafting a story and understanding how to take that and communicate it. And I would just say, one, get good at reading the room and be that Swiss army knife. I've had both of those over all many years, just, okay, I'll be more, I'll be really valuable if I just shut up and spend 80 hours coding until my eyes get go until I go blind mm -hmm. or I'll be way more valuable if I spend time really thoughtfully crafting a narrative because your team should be helping with certain things. Responsibilities should circulate. Your manager should be helping you. And if you're at a really small company, that's harder, but that's kind of the approach I would take. When we do analytics, and sometimes they're just noise. You can always find some story, especially when stakeholders expect an answer. Oh, I saw this 
spike. This thing dropped. It could be totally random. But with the pressure, I feel like sometimes data scientists have to come up with a um, story and then maybe over time, nobody looking back to evaluate whether this is true or not. So how do you know whether the insights the analytics team provide are true or useful? Have there been cases you just tell them, hey, I, I can tell a story, but it, it might just be noise. I don't have a story for you. One of my first jobs was being an auditor and mm -hmm. that embedded in me what auditors call professional skepticism. So I am always very skeptical of any data set or any claim. And I think one of the direction tech is moving, like if you really think about it, a lot of the capital, a lot of the investment dollars, I think a lot of the alpha, a lot of the value won't come from processing data or storing, even storing data, it'll come from gathering data. So mo mm -hmm. most often your problems come from the data gathering and data collection stage. Because we still shockingly have like very few systems that are good at collecting and gathering certain types of data. We have a ton that can process it. We have a ton of tools, a ton of techniques. That can pro we have a very, we have, there are three systems. There are literally three companies who are super stuffed to the gills with profit and margin that can gather and collect accounting data well. And I don't know why there's only three, and it's such a mystery to me. So most often when you have an analysis that is telling you something very strange, it's because a problem happened far upstream in the data collection or data gathering process. Yeah. And you have to be able to like, something I imbue in my teams is go from your conclusion and walk back and trace back and step back and audit all the way back to the real life event that created that data point. Because that's what we would do in, as auditors. You'd be shocked at how compartmentalized people get and how little they actually understand about where the data is coming from. They just say, where did that come from? And they say, well, it came from system B. No, it didn't. It came from system Z when Jimmy pushed this button and sent it to Manila and someone yeah. there pushed another button, it, 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 there's a very complex web of information mm -hmm. processing in our economy now. Yeah. And the companies that cleanse that out and figure that out will be incredibly valuable and successful. Yeah. And then the Jimmy might have left his job and then they changed the schema. Maybe Jimmy had that day made a mistake. In fraud interview. And we would actually sit down and interview people constantly oh, wow. and have them explain to us, what did you do? We called them. Mm -hmm. So the first step in any, um, and this is what, honestly, if you want to be a successful, if you're, if you're still in college, you're listening, start your career as an auditor. I wouldn't maybe not stay as an auditor, but it is super valuable to learn that professional skepticism. Mm. You get trained in looking at an end state and being able to reverse engineer it from start to finish. and oh. What you'll often find is the walkthrough, the interview with the people doing it is where you get most of your information. So if you just ask questions, if you just set up a meeting with somebody at your company and mm -hmm. do a walkthrough of their process or a walkthrough of their department, oh my goodness, you'll learn things you wouldn't even imagine were possible to learn. And that'll make you a much more dangerous data scientist. Yeah. So the first three months, maybe you just set up a lot of one-on-ones with your stakeholders or with your other teams, just yeah. learn their process and ask them to explain how they create this table. Never just take the documentation for an answer because it might be outdated. Oh, yeah. Don't uh, believe half of what you see and none of what you hear. They'll believe a little bit more about what you hear than what you see maybe than what people yeah. write down. So if we do a mock audit, say you're auditing me, what questions are you going to ask me? One of the reasons that I think J&J &J has survived for a hundred, for over a century, again, there are barely, there are countries that haven't lasted that long. One of the reasons is because they are really good at building a process. So there is a ton of investment all across our economy in people. There's a ton of investment in technology, but I see a huge lack of investment in good process and process mm. building. And to answer your question, I have to, un I would start with take me through the process 
that you yeah. followed to enter this data or collect mm -hmm. this data. And another way to think about that, because that is an interesting point I want to share, like McDonald's is another good example of an American industrial powerhouse, right? Why? McDonald's doesn't hire five-star chefs to go make Big Macs. You wouldn't go to that McDonald's. That would be a very painful experience. McDonald's built a process that's repeatable and scalable all across the planet. I've literally, I've eaten a Big Mac, I think on five continents. It tastes the same in every single continent. It's shocking. It's because they've built a process. They don't over invest. They don't over index on the genius. They don't over index on the advanced technology. They actually invest heavily in the process. And that is where the new school, like the new tech companies in the Bay Area, which by the way, Listeners, the first time we did this interview, there were like, we were in this like weird incubator thing in San Francisco. And there were all these people in the background, like cyborgs with their Apple visions on and I couldn't focus. No, much more focused. But the new school in the Bay, it's like there's no process. You go to some of these companies and it's, well, how do you review? What do you do every month to review your this number? There's literally not even a standing meeting. So that background now that like first principle knowledge is, is valuable. And it's okay, if I want to understand and learn about a company, I really need to understand their process and how they operate in steps one, two, three, four, five. Yeah. Instead of just focusing on the results, how this is, why this is this way, ask them to walk through the process and maybe you identify something that they couldn't see themselves. Mm -hmm. And going behind another layer Sometimes people get defensive. They don't want to show you their process. I think there's a difference when you're auditor, they have to show you the process, but they might hide something. Or you're a data scientist, they That's might, you, right? They, they might, hey, why do I have to show you? They're just like kind of, so how do you earn the trust and make them feel comfortable? I'm going to show all my messy Jupyter notebook, my process to you. That's a great question. And so yeah, when you're, let's make it real for the data scientists listening, you don't have that audit badge. That was a badge that was really useful to flash and walk in the room and be like, all right, show me every, like, literally every, we had a charter signed by the board of directors that said we could see yeah. anything we wanted, like literally any document, you cannot hide anything. You don't have that as a data scientist. Okay, where does that connect to the early part of the conversation? Persuasion. So you have to be able to connect with somebody, relate to them build trust. And I think the other thing that everyone senses, and it's like a human, which is a part of any relationship is intention. I think like mm. intention is super obvious when someone has the wrong intentions, or like you're not sure of their intentions. It's so it's like the first thing you pick up on. And it's always yeah, like, oh, that was a weird interaction. Why, why, why didn't that sit right? It's because the person probably didn't have good intentions. So if you go into a conversation, which is good intentions, look, I want to help you. I want to help the company. I want to do good at my job. I think everyone respects that and everyone loves that. And they will be very open. I've always been like over, overly generous with what I know mm -hmm. and with what I think might be valuable or a good lesson or learning for someone. But also someone might know that they don't have the best process and they don't, they didn't do the best job three months ago. And they'll be very uncomfortable sharing that. But that's also why intention is so good. If you show up being like, okay, my intention is to help you and help us. Those conversations will go very, will very much go your way and very, and yeah. end very well for you. It, guess what won't end well is if you're just mm -hmm. silent and you just stay in your little pod and you're not curious and you don't try to step back and use at least some of those audit techniques or persuasion techniques to learn a bit more about your company. Yeah, yeah. And also, I think you can, if you are genuine, you're not trying to make them look back, look bad, you can provide some psychological safety saying, hey, this conversation is just for me to learn, I'm not right. going to share with anyone. And sometimes you can also share, hey, by the way, I, I did something Similar, it was a, like a draft. I understand it doesn't have to look super polished, but uh, something like that. For example, when I interview guests, I provide psychological safety. I tell them, hey, anything you don't like, you can cut them later. I'm mm -hmm. not here to get you. So that's why they feel more comfortable to talk. And I'm genuine. Uh, I have guests recorded full episode and they work for, say, like hedge fund. They don't want to publish it. It's a great episode, but, you know, I 
honor my promise. And that's another very related concept. You honor that promise. And people know when you breach that. And I think some of the most successful people I know, including my, and I hold myself to this standard, if something is said to you in confidence, you don't repeat it anywhere, right? Because people will find out and know. And if someone confides in me, then I will honor that and maintain that trust. Yeah. So I really like the rabbit hole sometimes we fall into talking about influence and the deeper level of human connection in the broader sense of tech and, and data science. What are some other things that you feel uh, data science or, or generally people should pay attention to or learn when they just workplace the things beyond the tech? So what I can maybe pass down are things that I was taught by some very seasoned and good leaders at J&J. Because like we said, folks, if you're listening to this and you want to know what model, what machine learning model you should use, what decision tree is the hottest one right now, you can find that on Google. You can figure, you're all smart enough to figure that out yourself. But there are things that many people I've met go their whole careers never maybe getting. And one of those is just about leadership. And what I what I took from a few leaders, so one, even if you're an individual contributor level, or if you are well, a couple of things, one, everyone's a leader, you're always leading all the time, you, you should be a good leader, you should be a good follower. There's otherwise, you're like a dictator or whatever, but so you're always leading. And if you want to progress in your career, you have to get good at leading. And that means understanding some of those key ingredients and everyone has a different style, but I can share what's really worked and what I've seen work really well is when, and this is hard, this is really hard for the very technically competent, like engineers and data people. This is another thing that is very unnatural and many of them will never be able to do this. But if you can, then it's like pouring rocket fuel on your career, right? Building that emotional intelligence, being able to manage that, your own emotional state and the state of those around you is really valuable. That stoicism, I think studying stoicism is really interesting. So definitely check that out if you haven't. So how do I do that? But two, envision yourself as what kind of leader would you be in 10 years? What kind of C-suite, mm. what kind of C chief data officer or chief analytics officer would you be? And then start behaving that way. So one of my favorite lines is dress. Here's an East Coast thing for all you Bay Area cool cats out there. There's no, in New York, people still wear suits mm. and dress for the job you want, not the job you have. Mm. So one day I showed up to work dressed like Chris Angel, the magician, but that didn't go too well. But it's the same for leadership. So show up to work leading for the leading like you would as a leader in five years or in three years, if you do want that promotion. Yeah. And what I've seen work really well are when people, I'll never forget this. So here's something that's just burned into my memory. And the people he did this with, it's burned into theirs too. And they talk about it decades later. I literally see it. There was a leader at Jay. And... I'll just say his name. His name is Gary Fair. He retired, but he was great. Day one, you would start. First of all, he was extremely high up in the company. He was like party to the board of directors, right? You would start. And within a week, someone would reach out and be like, hey, you have to have your one-on-one -on -one with Gary. Okay. Well, I just walked out of college like a week ago and I don't even know how to tie my shoes. I still, I'm still trying to find the bathroom and I have to go talk to this incredibly high up executive. You'd walk into his office and you'd be a little scared. You'd be like, oh, this guy, this is very intimidating. He'd have all these like crazy trophies behind him for things that you didn't even know they gave trophies for. And you'd sit down and Gary would just look at you and say, I am here for you. What can I do so that this is the best experience? What can I do so that this is the best job you've ever had? What can I do so that you feel comfortable? You feel safe in your job? You feel like you are developing? What can I share with you? And that was just the ethos he gave. And you'd walk out and then he lived it. He lived it every day. When you have a leader like that, a service-minded leader, when things get hard, you will work really hard for that person. Like 
They yeah. never have to send you a nasty email. Mm-hmm. When things get hard for you in your personal life, you might need a cup. You might need some. You might need some time off. And he'll let that happen. He'll say, you know what? Yeah, you had someone pass away. Go like just leave work right now. Don't even think about work. We're here for you. We're here, we're here to take care of you. I know you'll make it up at some point, right? Like I know you'll come back energy once you're through this time. A passionate employee, right? And that ethos that Gary had. I think was given to him through more decades of leaders before him at J&J, because again, the company has been around for over a century. So everyone should be like looking at that place with a magnifying glass and saying, why, why is this mm-hmm. enduring? Why did Xerox fail? Yeah. Or they, or I think they're still around, but so yeah. yeah, my leadership style is like, I'm here for you. What can I do to serve you? How do I prove that I'm like right here with you? in the trenches with you and making sure this is a great experience and job for you. A yeah, lot of data people awesome. aren't like that. I do say that, but as a performance, they're not actually there for you, but they want to, I don't know, feel good or look good. So I really respect that someone says that genuinely, like also embody that, right? I and mean, also from employee Sorry. perspective, I think it's also for you to think about what do you want? What kind of support do you want to get? Where do you want to be? Because maybe one day someone really wants to help you ask you these questions and you have no answers. So even if they really want to help you, they don't know how to help you. So maybe also some self-reflection. It's a hard question. What do you want? And a lot of times you don't know what you want and ask yourself sometimes three times, five times, 10 times, you might get to the answer. Yeah. Yeah. You don't know what you want. And, um, I think these are things that are not natural traits of engineering technical people. I think they yeah. move, I think I've seen it more often than I have. They move up in a company and they just become like very difficult people to work with. I like it's it's strange and they don't last that long in those leadership roles. <clears throat> uh, yeah, because leading a team is very different than writing 500 lines of SQL. Like it's completely different. But if you can combine those skills, but you have a special sauce. Yeah. All right, Chris. So what do you want? What do you want to achieve next couple of years? Well, Where do you see your career grow? That's a great question. I think I just building teams and communities and networks that kind of lift each other up. So whether that's my team or whether that's a different team or whoever, it just I'll keep keep on doing that. That's a good question. I actually don't have an answer. Actually, I could talk another hour about that problem. Where do you see yourself? <laughs> Are five you years inviting now? yourself back yeah, to another no. episode? Yeah, episode two. Yeah. Uh, we'll have to change the title to the data leadership therapy hour. Yeah, but I love that. Yeah, no, I think I think you should have some plan, but if you asked me five years ago would I be here, I, I would have said something I would have said something completely different. I don't even know what yeah, I would have said. Yeah. I would have said maybe magician. No, I'm just kidding. No, yeah, I think who knows what the world will look like in five years. Like I said, I don't know if knowing SQL is going to be a valuable way to pay the bills. Uh, yeah. So let's mm-hmm. let's learn together, everybody. Before we wrap up, if for people who want to find you, maybe someone want to have a philosophical debate with you, where can they find you online? Yeah, if anyone wants to uh, pondering and having these <laughs> philosophical debates, I'd love to. You can just send me a message on LinkedIn. It's Christopher Fricker. I think you have to hit the button to add me as a connection or send me a message. Some send somehow. a message. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell see people it. you love the episode. Yeah, say we'll, we'll do a code word. Say like octopus or something. So I know to read it. Yeah. Okay. Octopus. Send octopus word or emoji to. Yeah, just the emoji, Christopher... not the word. I like oh, the, just the emoji. Yeah, just the emoji. Yeah, I won't read the word. Okay, right. All right. I really enjoyed the conversation, Chris. And thank you so much for coming to the show. Wow, this was phenomenal. Yeah, thank you, Dalian. I think you, you have a great show and I wish you best of luck in the future.